Thank you so much for uh, attending our annual Sunshine Business Luncheon. This uh, takes the place of our annual meeting. Uh, we've changed some things around this year, date, place, but you guys all figured it out and showed up, so that's a good first step right there. I'm Colin Hastings. I'm the Executive Director of the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank uh, uh, our sponsors, uh, GISA Credit Union, for being our uh, um, annual meeting sponsor, and also for the Policy Center for being our keynote sponsor. But at this time, I'd like to ask for you to rise for the singing of our national anthem, that will be performed by Tri-City's outstanding teen, Audrey Falk. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocky red glare, the bonds bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That was that was great. So nice to have uh, Miss Tri Cities organization uh, uh, work with us on on providing uh, uh, the national anthem for this and our Ag Hall of Fame uh, that we always have at the beginning of the year and other uh, 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 times as well too. It's a really good program. Um, I'd like to take a moment and introduce elected officials that have joined us here today. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, um, from Congressman Dan Newhouse's office, Jamie Daniels. Did she make it in? Oh, there she is. Let's give her a round of applause. And Washington State Representative Mary Dye. Did she make it in? She might be at the Red Lion, so she might sneak in a little bit later. Uh, from Franklin County, we have Commissioners Bob Cook, Brad Peck, and Rick Miller. We have Franklin County Clerk Michael Killian. There he is over there. Franklin County Treasurer Josie Kelzer. I see her. I thought I saw her. Uh, Franklin PUD Commissioner Stu Nelson. There he is. <laughs> okay, it's an election year, you can say. <laughs> we have uh, Benton PUD Commissioner Barry Bush. And from the Port of Pasco, we have Commissioners Jim Clinworth, Gene Reichman, and Vicki Gordon. I think I got everybody. You tried sneaking in on me, but I saw you. So, um, also wanted to uh, take a moment out uh, and introduce uh, past presidents of the Pasco Chamber that have uh, uh, joined us here today. Uh, as you know, the chamber has been around for a long, long time, over 100 years, and, and we do take pride in the service that our board and our, our leadership has taken over the years. And so I'd like to introduce some of those uh, uh, past presidents that have uh, joined us here today. Uh, Derek Brownson with Community First Bank. I think he was supposed to be here. 
Anyways, if he was here, he, was, he would be really excited the fact that he's now known as past president, because that means his responsibilities have diminished somewhat. And then uh, Ryan Brault. Where's Ryan Brault? There's Ryan. Uh, Julie Killian. Julie's back there as well, too. Uh, Kevin Williams. Where's Kevin? There's Kevin. Uh, Honorable Doc Hastings as well. And then uh, um, John Schultz has joined us as well, too. John's back there. I remember when I first started at the Pasco Chamber, looking through all the history and a great photo of, of John. I think it was in 75 or 76. It was the year of the goat, where you, if you weren't a member of the Pasco Chamber, John Schultz was going to show up with a goat on your doorstep or at your business doorstep until you joined the Pasco Chamber. Otherwise, this goat was going to hang around. So that was kind of the fun they had. And of course, last but not least is uh, Ed Ray, who was also in that photo as well, too, leading the charge, known as the godfather of the Pasco Chamber, too. Let's give them all a round of applause. I hope I didn't miss any of the past presidents. So uh, uh, thank you so much for, for making it out today. Uh, so this past year, uh, Pasco Chamber um, has been uh, a, a very exciting year for us, uh, for the staff, for the board. We've, uh, we've grown our, our staff quite a bit, but we, we continue on with, with the, the mission that was established in 1912, is to serve as the front door for thousands of individuals and businesses. Uh, and businesses that range from agriculture to, to education, the chamber is a major supporter of the greater Pasco area. And the 1718 the board have been leaders on this, making sure that we continue with the accomplishments. And so some of those accomplishments uh, over this past year uh, include uh, number one, and it's, I guess it's in the process, is technically we're in our new fiscal year, but Riverfest is a major, uh, is a major undertaking that the Pasco chamber is taking on. Uh, that is tomorrow. This is part of the reason why our annual meeting is being held today, because we're having it in conjunction with uh, a really timely event now, with, as, as there's a lot of discussion, political discussion, on the importance of our uh, hydroelectric system. So uh, this all started a few years ago when uh, the Port of Whitman had a idea to do a Snake River Family Festival at Boyer Park, uh, up on the Snake River. And I don't know if there's been many people that have been to Boyer Park, but it takes a little while to get there, even from Pullman. But uh, it really encompasses a, the, the idea of having a venue where you can discuss the importance of the hydropower system, but do it in a hands-on way, an educational sort of way, by inviting all the elements and uh, organizations and companies and associations that utilize our river systems giving them an opportunity to tell their story. <clears throat> I think uh, a lot of times just the, the focus of the issue is always narrowed down just on dams and nobody really talks about all the importance to it. And I think sometimes we take it for granted as well too because it has really been the lifeblood of what has grown our region, the Tri-Cities region and, and the Northwest quite frankly with how the hydropower system has accomplished that. So with that, um, Linda with the Port of Whitman enlisted the Pasco Chamber to give us an opportunity to recreate something similar in the Tri-Cities where we can have an area where we have higher visibility and more population so that we can continue on this mission of, of letting people, uh, letting the public know and, and an opportunity to learn as to the whole system and what it means to them. Uh, so with that, we took the charge and, and we asked for help through the Tri-Cities and through the Northwest and have had, as you see on your uh, um, pamphlets there, all the partners that we've had. Uh, it really was, uh, it really was comforting to see and actually made it a lot easier to see how easy it was to get all these partners to jump on board. A lot of these partners jumped in financially too so that we can launch something that maybe we can do year after year after year as well too and continue this dialogue in a positive sort of manner. And so uh, along with that, they've stepped up. We have 50 exhibitors that are going to be down at Columbia Park telling their story. Um, and for the first year, 
uh, of, of putting something on at this magnitude really couldn't have been done without their help, all the volunteer helps. There's a lot of folks in this room that are right after this lunch are gonna be probably heading down to Columbia Park to help set up. And then we'll be there first thing in the morning as well too to continue on the mission. You know, we, our goal is just to have this conversation, educate people on the importance of the hydropower system, but do it in a fun, engaging sort of way. So the idea is to bring families down there. So we'll have fun activities for kids to get dirty in and, and play around in and learn, and, 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 and it's fun for the whole family. So it had to be free as well, too. We don't know how many people we're going to have tomorrow. Um, when we started this endeavor with the Pasco Chamber and the, the committee that's been putting this on, you know, I think we were thinking if we got 500 people, we'd be ecstatic. Um, not knowing what tomorrow is going to be, but I think that would be on the low side. I think we're going to have a lot more. A lot of the funds that were raised were used for advertising to get people there. And I hope that if you, ha if you haven't seen or heard the radio commercials or you haven't seen anything on digital media, uh, you must be just on Sirius, Sirius XM radio or something along those lines because we've, we've definitely invested quite a bit into that. And then use those funds as well too to engage Puget Sound region as well too. I think that's the next step in this process. We hope somebody can carry on this mission that was started with the Port of Whitman on down the river that somebody in the Portland, Vancouver area could, could also do something like this and, and make it in a, in a way where it's, it's approachable. Uh, and, uh, and I think we'll see nothing but good positives coming out of it. So that was a major piece for the Pasco Chamber this past year. We've, we help assist with economic development with our partners with the Port of Pasco and the City of Pasco. Along those lines, Pasco was recognized in a couple major ways this year, being recognized as the third safest city in the state. That deserves a round of applause just right there for being that recognition. I mean, with, with all the growth that Pasco has experienced, and, uh, and the Tri-Cities as well too. And just to keep up with that, a lot of kudos goes to our leadership and our chief uh, uh, Metzger uh, in the city to, um, to making sure we can do that. And along those lines too, we, we, we applied for All America City. We had a great time going down to Denver and competing with that with 20 other cities from around the United States, some very ma large metro areas, this close this close from being recognized from that. I think they really wanted us back next year so they didn't give us the award. I think we did such a good job that they just felt like we had to play equal. And, and, but uh, that being said, it really offered an uh, introspective way to see how a community, how we're operating and what we're doing. And it was very fulfilling. I think for everybody that was there, it would have been especially fulfilling to you know unveil a banner here today, but uh, we're, we're not, stopping with that because we're, we're going to do it again next year and uh, um, though there was some disappointment we we're very excited that that pasco was was recognized especially for the first year of just dropping an application there are, there are hundreds of applications that are submitted every year and to become a finalist is something to be very proud of we do a lot of events too at the pasco chamber if you haven't noticed uh, one of them this year was our third year doing asparagus fest had a little bit of growing pains this year growing in a good way Whereas last year we had 350 attendees and this year we had probably about a thousand more than that. And so um, I think having a partnership with the Asparagus Commission, promoting a commodity here and mixing that with beer and wine helps too. We really captured something that is unique to our area um, and we look forward to continuing on that relationship. We have a fundraiser every year for the uh, part of the Pasco Chamber with our sagebrush scramble. I think we've done this for seven years now. That's, and it's a, it really is a fun tournament. I know I see Tyler nodding his head. I think he's been there every year. We have a really good time uh, uh, just getting out and, and relaxing and, and, and Sun Will has, has, has been very accommodating for us on that. Uh, we do hundreds of certificates of origin per year. We sponsor the Hay King Award. We've done the uh, Crawdad Boil the second year we've done that. You know we're. We're hoping for a big increase next year. This year we had nearly 200 people show up to that, so that was a good growth from about 75 the year before. Again, really focusing on niche sort of events. I think that's what intrigues 
the community to come in and, and engage. The, the crawdads, th th that was one of the major sort of arguments between our chefs. If it's a crawdad, a crayfish, a crawfish. In the South, they say crayfish, and our chefs, of course, are from the South. But our crawdads are sourced locally, actually, out of the Snake River uh, from Lewiston. And so uh, we went through 300 pounds real quick this year. Uh, next year, we're going to probably go through 500 pounds because we expect more people to come up. We do the Ag Hall of Fame uh, uh, gala. We've done that for 16 years. Port of Pasco is a major sponsor for that. It's an, uh, it's an opportunity for the Pasco Chamber to, to really acknowledge the importance of the ag industry within our region and, and how it's a lifeblood of our economy here in Franklin County. Um, it's a tough event because nobody really likes the recognition, but we really, with our ag uh, committee, really want to acknowledge those that have made a difference. And, and it's not for a lack of a pool too, because it's a large pool to draw from. So it's really challenging for that committee to, to uh, honor uh, the, the recipients every year. And so we have that in January and, and also in January every year. Oh, along with the Ag Hall of Fame too, we, we've started something new where we have a Cultivating Our Future grant. Uh, we just help foster it. It is, it is that industry and uh, the ag industry that helps fund that. But we were able to grant $10,000 this past year to youth-oriented groups that are doing, uh, that have a mission or a project that helps engage youth in agriculture. Uh, that was a step up from a couple thousand dollars last year, $10,000 this year. We see that growing. It's neat to see the return on the investment already uh, with that. Our Ag Expo is here every year. We've done that for years. I mean, we don't really know how long, but 30 plus years, I think. It's here at Track. We're changing it up a little bit because uh, if you haven't seen yet, and if Track is willing, you've got to take a look at the arena side. They, they put some concrete down and did a little remodeling over there. So our, our Expo is going to be on that side uh, in uh, January. It'll present some challenges for us because we'll be starting kind of over again, but I think it will it'll really uh, engage the vendors and the participants that much more and allows us to have a luncheon correspond that day here in the same building. And so uh, our January luncheon uh, will be the uh, January 9th, I believe, uh, and it'll be in here. So we encourage our Pasco Chamber members to attend with that. And then a lot of the ag community will be here as well too. So it's a good opportunity for all of us to come together. And, and work towards a, a bright future for, for the whole region. And then, uh, um, you know, this wouldn't have been done without obviously the support of our board, but without the support and the hard work of our uh, Pasco Chamber staff. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge Marilyn Lott and Rebecca Ramsey, if they can come up, please, or just stand up and, and let's give them a round of applause for the work they've done. We have a fourth uh, staffer as well, too, Allie Talmadge, who's, who's fairly new to the organization. She's over at Columbia Park putting that on together. You'd think we'd be crazy to put on all these events together in the last couple of days, but that just shows the importance of, of this issue to the Pasco Chamber. We, we, we view ourselves as a champion of ag because it is, it is the backbone of our economy. Um, and so that's why we, we have such a focus around that, but we want to continue to, to keep fighting for what we know is it works and what is right. So um, I thank you for your time and a quick, a quick, it seemed like that was too quick to, uh, <laughs> to wrap up last year because it, it definitely took a lot of work for, from all the staff and the volunteers. So um, with that, I'd like to invite Dennis Giese to come up to the, the stage now and he's gonna provide us the, the, the pathway through the rest of our program. He is the, soon to be or is the outgoing uh, uh, president from 2017 with John L. Scott. So let's give him a warm round of applause. All right. All right. Thank you, Colin. See if this works. Can you hear me? OK, thank you. We got to get uh, uh, get organized here for a little bit. <clears throat> so, 
Um, our sponsor today is uh, uh, GISA, uh, Federal Credit Union, and today Jeremy Wiersma uh, is here to talk to you a little bit about GISA. So, Jeremy, we used to work together. I haven't seen him in a long time. This is this is this is great. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeremy Wiersma. I'm the Assistant Vice President and Team Leader for Commercial Services at GISA Credit Union, and I'm excited to welcome you to the annual Sunshine Luncheon. Um, still not sure why I got chosen for this, I, but I think I figured it out. Friday afternoon, tough to find a banker on Friday afternoon, so I think I'm the only one that uh, got the short straw on that, but no. Um, for those who aren't familiar with GISA, uh, we currently operate 18 member service centers throughout Eastern Washington, as well as 10 student-run high school credit unions. You may be wondering what makes GISA different than some of the other financial institutions. Uh, well, we have an internal slogan that we've had since I've worked there for almost seven years, um, and we all truly believe in that, and that every member matters, and we truly live by that. Our members are not just numbers to us, they're our neighbors, they're our favorite restaurant owners, um, and every one of them is important to GISA's success. GISA is committed to giving back to the community. Uh, in fact, we are proud to announce that last year, 2017, we delivered over $900,000 back to the communities we serve. Uh, we are excited to continue and grow that number every year. Um, some of the things specifically we've done for PASCO, uh, for the last three years, we've been the major sponsor of the PASCO Chamber Golf Tournament fundraiser. Uh, we create small business success series. Our own Angie Brotherton serves on, no, you don't anymore? Okay. Back in the day, she served on the board. Um, and we participate in the barn run, uh, the auction, and we will be at Riverfest this week, and we're very excited about that. Um, GISA is committed to developing entrepreneurship and the importance and support of our local chambers. I am proud to say that we have two tables here doing just that. We are committed to our members, committed to developing the business community, and committed to keeping PASCO a fantastic place to work and live. GISA has a full array of services and lending options to support small and large businesses. Our experienced team is dedicated to our members. We know the community, and we are here, and we invite you to come and see us. And as I wrap things up, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Colin and his staff, the board of directors, and committees who help the Pasco Chamber grow every year. We as members truly appreciate all your service. Again, thank you for coming and supporting the PASCO Chamber this afternoon. I was just thinking that when you said it, I think you got to short straws, the reason that you had to give the, give the, uh, be the representation for GISA. So, at this time, I'd like to welcome Todd Myers from Washington Policy Center. Uh, Todd is the director of the Center for the Environment at Washington Policy Center. He is one of the nation's leading experts on free market environmental policy. Todd is the author of the landmark 2011 book, EcoFads, How the Rise of Trendy Environmentalism is Harming the Environment, and was a Wall Street Journal uh, expert, panelist for energy and the environment. He has authored numerous studies on environmental issues, including five years of environmental policy, are we making a difference, uh, promoting personal choice, incentives and investment to cut greenhouse gases and more. Todd's in-depth research on the failure of the state's 2005 green building mandate continues to receive national attention. He formerly served on the executive team at the Washington State Department of Natural Resources and was the director of public relations for the Seattle Supersonics and the director of public affairs for the Seattle Mariners. 
Todd holds a master's degree from University of Washington. Please help me welcome Todd Myers. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, as you heard, I used to be Director of Public Affairs for the Seattle Mariners, and I currently work in environmental policy, which explains the amount of hair I have. <laughs> um, I wanna uh, thank you for the invite. It's always good to um, uh, talk with the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. Chambers of Commerce are really um, critical. They are your voice. Um, a lot of times when public policy is being made, when there are meetings, when there are events, um, business people have a hard time going. Uh, to talk to government officials, to testify at hearings, uh, and to be part of public events. Um, and Chambers of Commerce are there to advocate and represent you. Um, the governor uh, has what he calls his ORCA task force to try to determine how we can bring uh, the southern resident killer whales back and improve their population. And the first meeting was up in Wenatchee. And the voices that were heard overwhelmingly were from people who wanted to uh, tear down the Snake River dams. Um, and one of them stood out, which is an eight-year-old, um, who was very compelling and referred to the Snake River dams as megaliths of death. Now, uh, I didn't know the word megalith when I was eight years old, but that's what they're hearing. That's the voice that they're hearing. And so um, it's great that you have an active Chamber of Commerce that is representing the community um, so that while you are all doing the work that you do every day, um, that you are not being forgotten in these debates. And the challenge is, is that the way we make environmental policy, I've been doing environmental policy for now about 20 years. In addition to working at the State Department of Natural Resources, I, used, I uh, currently sit on the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council where we're trying to figure out how to increase the population of salmon um, on the west side of the state, both for orca and for uh, fishers and uh, just because salmon are important to have. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time and what I find is is that when we make public policy, it's a lot, it reminds me a lot of when I was recently in Las Vegas. And I came out of a, a casino and, and uh, there was a guy who looked sort of disheveled and um, he came up to me and said, excuse me, sir, do you have any money I haven't eaten today? I said, well, if I give you money, how do I know that you're not just gonna gamble it? And he said, oh, well, I've got gambling money. And I see that all the time as to how politicians make decisions about where they put their priorities and where we spend our money. And so as we have a debate and a discussion about what we can do for salmon, one of the things that I hear all the time is we don't have enough money. We need to increase taxes. We have an initiative on the ballot this fall, 1631, which is a carbon tax, which will, in its first year, raise about $600 million in taxes for all sorts of environmental projects. And that's the argument, is we don't have enough money. But actually, what I find is that if you look, you can find that there's money everywhere. We just don't prioritize it. So the city of Seattle, Seattle City Light, had to build a substation, a new substation, the, the Denny substation. And they came back with the design, and the design was about $50 million. And they sent the design to the Seattle Design Committee to see what their thoughts were. And they said, this is good, we need a few other things. So they added a meeting space, a public meeting space into the public building so that people could meet. They added an off-leash dog park because every electrical substation needs an off-leash dog park. <laughs> they added an elevative, elevated interpretive walkway so that you could walk around and, and learn more about electricity and substations off the ground. They also said that the paneling now made it so that it had a nice soft glow at night. So they made all of these changes. 
And the cost of the substation went from $50 million to $180 million. There was no improvement in the functionality of the substation, just in the aesthetics and the amenities. And they spent $130 million on the amenities associated with the substation. To put in context what $130 million would do for salmon, there is a list called uh, the Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration Project List that are big sort of capital projects where you restore areas for habitat for salmon and steelhead, um, and these are significant projects. The most recent list came out of all of the priority projects, and it was less than $50 million. $130 million would pay for the entire Puget Sound capital project list for salmon, not once, not twice, but almost three times. And yet what we hear all the time is, is that we don't have enough money. Where are we going to get the money? But we spend $130 million on interpretive walkways in Seattle. It is a ridiculous waste of money, and when politicians, especially on the west side, say that they care about salmon and spend money this way, it's very clear that they don't. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason that this is not the only example. We make decisions like this all the time when it comes to environmental policy. Uh, and the reason is because given a choice between policies that are effective and policies that make us feel good, we choose environmental policies that make us feel good. So there were two researchers at the University of Toronto who wanted to see what the effect of this, how, how powerful this was, this feeling of feeling good when you do something environmental. So um, when I was in college, I had no money. Um, and if I wanted to eat, I would find a psychology test. And then you would go and you'd do their little psychology test. And they would give you a piece of pizza or a cookie or something like that. So there were two researchers who did this at the University of Toronto with students. And they said uh, there were two setups. One group could buy items online where 95% of the products were green and 5% were traditional. And the other group went and bought it on online where 95% of the products were traditional and 5% were green. And they would say, okay, here you have $50, go buy stuff. So they would do it. And after they were done, they said, thank you very much for doing that. Oh, by the way, we have another test that we'd like you to be part of. If you could do that, it's a, it's a trivia quiz. Well, this was the real test to see how they behaved on the trivia quiz. And what they said is, well, here's the quiz. Oh, by the way, we don't have enough people to grade the quiz. So here are the answers. Um, and then for every right answer you get, take a quarter out of this envelope. And so they wanted to see if buying green products affected how, they, how honest they would be in answering the questions and how much money they took out. And here's what they found. While merely exposing students to green products increased their level of altruism in subsequent experiments, actually buying green products reduced their altruism significantly. The researchers concluded that the people in the experiment were, quote, more likely to cheat and steal after purchasing green products than after purchasing conventional products. Having committed an act that they considered altruistic, like helping the planet, the participants felt that they had the moral license to cheat a bit elsewhere. Buying green, being green is a powerful emotional, um, it gives you a powerful emotional reaction. And that's what we see a lot of our policies made by politicians is about looking and feeling good. And the problem is, is that when we make bad environmental decisions, we don't want to admit that we're wrong. So Phil Tetlock, who's a, a researcher, a, so, a social scientist, um, looks at how people make decisions and how they change their minds. And what he says is, is that social psychologists have long known that getting people to publicly commit to a belief is a great way to freeze it in place, making it resistant to change. The stronger the commitment, the greater the resistance. So once you say, I believe in this, even if it turns out not to be true and somebody points it out to you, 
you will dig your heels in because it's very hard for people to admit that they were wrong publicly. Doing it privately is different. We do that all the time. That's what businesses do every day. If you make a bad decision and you're losing money, you're going to change your mind because you have to. You feel the personal costs. But if the benefit to you is in a public sense, if you look good to the voters or you look good to special interest groups, you're going to be very resistant to change your mind. And unfortunately, that's how we make environmental policy today. And the Snake River dams are a perfect example of what we're seeing. There's one state senator who tweeted out recently, and, and he had a piece in the Seattle Times, saying that tearing down the Snake River dams was the fastest way to get more salmon into Puget Sound. And so I asked him, show me the data that says that. Show me the study that says that. And he never responded. But he didn't back down either. There is no study that says that. Tearing down the Snake River dams will take decades to get significant populations of salmon back to Puget Sound. And NOAA Fisheries itself says that the Snake River is far down the list of populations that are critical to southern resident orca. And so even if it had the impact that some on the left claim, of increasing salmon populations, southern resident orca would see only a tiny fraction of that, and it would not solve the problem. And yet, for that state senator, I can guarantee you he will continue to say that, because he has made that statement publicly, and he has been rewarded for it by the special interest groups that he cares about. There are other problems. It gets very emotional. And that emotion makes us react irrationally. So you may have seen uh, that one of the orca, the southern resident orca, named Tahlequah, um, gave birth to a calf that died. No southern resident orca calves have lived in the last three years. Every single one of them has died. This is a real issue. Southern resident orca population is declining. They are really struggling. And watching that mother carry around that calf for almost three weeks was very moving. And it indicates that there is a problem that we have to address. But, the prob but that seeing that should make us be more serious about what we do, not more emotional. And it's actually had the reverse effect. And the chair of the Spokane City Council put on his Facebook in seeing that said, this has to be her communicating and called for the removal of the dams. It's fine to be moved by it. But at the point when you're saying, oh, that the, the orca are talking to us and telling us what public policy we should do, we have moved from science to emotion. We have moved from policies that will work to policies that feel good. And that is not going to help Tahlequah or any of the other southern resident orca. And we see the same mistakes made again and again. In 1999, a number of groups who wanted to tear down the Snake River dams took out a full page ad in the New York Times saying that unless we act to tear down the Snake River dams, by 2017, the salmon and the Snake River will be extinct. NOAA Fisheries just put out a one-pager this week talking about all of the things that we can do to help southern resident orca. And they address the Snake River. And they put out a chart that shows that the number of wild and hatchery fish in the last decade is well above the number of wild and hatchery fish in the Snake River in the 1960s. We have more fish today coming out of the Snake River than we did 50 years ago. We need to continue that. That's, those are the facts, and we can't let the emotion get in our way. Lastly, there are some people who say, if we tear down the dams, it's OK. We can replace the electricity. The dams produce about 7% of Washington State's electricity. It doesn't just go to Washington State. It goes throughout the region. But for a metric, that's a useful way to understand it. 
that is equivalent to every single wind turbine and solar panel in Washington state. Imagine if we said, let's tear down every single wind turbine and solar panel in Washington state, all of that carbon free energy, what would the environmental community do? And yet that's what they are advocating. So a group called the Northwest Energy Coalition, which is trying to support tearing down the Snake River Dam said, it's okay, we can tear these down and we can replace them. And it won't actually cost that much more. They did admit that it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars in additional expenses. And we would only get 86% of the energy back. So we pay more and we get less. And this week, they wrote an editorial in the Tri-City Herald saying, yes, it'll cost more, but Tri-Cities will get part of that. Because maybe we'll build some of those wind turbines and solar panels here in the Tri-Cities area. What they didn't mention is that their own study that says that we can replace it puts all of the wind turbines in Montana and all of the solar panels in southern Idaho. So they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They say it won't cost very much, but they don't tell you that the low cost alternative doesn't put any of that replacement value here in the Tri-Cities or even in Washington State. They want to try to get, they want to convince you that it's going to be costless, even as they themselves know there's a very high cost. This is why Peter Kareva, who was uh, the head of the NOAA Fisheries Project that looked at the Snake River Dam's impact in uh, the early 2000s, has concluded that it has become clear that salmon conservation is being used as a means to an end of dam removal as opposed to an end of its own accord. That's the goal. The goal is dam removal. And the phrase that you hear all the time is a wild and free river. And you can point out the science that says that it won't have impact on salmon runs, that it won't have impact on orca, but they still argue that we need to do it anyway. We need to turn away from this approach, from an approach where feeling good and looking good and the emotional approach is primary in how we make decisions to one where decisions are made based on results, where we take the personal responsibility for doing it. And there's a way to do that. So everybody in the world now has a smartphone. And the beauty is, is that we have more information at our hands to find ways to do more with less. The free market is the best system ever devised at finding ways to make a better use of resources. That is at the heart of what it means to be an environmentalist to use fewer resources and to get more out of them. And we now have the information to do that. And I can tell you that right now, at my home um, in Sammamish, that I am using about 500 watts of electricity. And that my uh, garage um, refrigerator is on, at this very second, on, on just on my app. And I can tell you how much I'm using and where I can save. And I've already made changes in my house. This is information that simply wasn't even available to us five years ago. You couldn't go out and watch the little spinning thing and figure out which of your appliances were using most of your electricity. Now you can use, you can get this on your phone. I have a Nest thermostat. My Nest thermostat uses artificial intelligence to know when I'm in the house and when I leave to turn up and down the temperature. It knows that if it wants to increase the temperature in my house, when at the best, best times to do it. And now in some cases, Nest has actually worked with utilities where if you save energy, it will give you a reward on your utility bill. It will give you a financial incentive to save money. And if I do something wrong, I'm going to change. Because as much as my, my ideology might say that I should do this, if that doesn't work and I feel the costs, I'm going to change. I don't have to tell all of you what an idiot I was for doing this instead of that. I can just do it quietly. That's the power of incentives in the free market, and it's the power that we have now with personal technology. And we need to move environmental decision making from the realm of the political and emotional in, into the palm of your hand where you have personal incentives and the information to do it.
It is an amazing time. In so many ways, we are stuck in our environmental thinking in the 1970s. The success of the Clean Air Act at cleaning our air is wonderful, but it has given us a false sense of where the solutions lie here in 2018. We now have technology and the ability to do things we could never do in 1970. Only the EPA could do what it did in the 1970s. That's not true today. And we now can do better things to help the environment. And that's where we need to move. That's what we talk about at the Washington Policy Center. It's the work that we do. And on your way out, we have a, a few of them, a brochures on the back, talking about the work that we're doing on energy in Washington State, on the Snake River dams, and to try to make sure that we are making rational decisions about salmon, about orca, so that we can continue to have a good economy and a good chamber of commerce here in the Tri-Cities. At the same time, we can preserve salmon and help recover the orca for the future. So take a look at that. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it's good to talk with you all. <clears throat> I have time for two questions, I'm being told. Either that or he was giving me the peace sign. I'm not sure which. Yes, sir. I think what you see, so the question is, is there, are there other areas of policy where we're being more rational? And I think what you find where you're making rational policies is the, the decisions are closer to people. The, the more local you get the decisions, the better they are. The farther away they are, the more distant they are from the impact to people, and the more it is about sort of politics and grandstanding, right? We've seen a lot of that <laughs> recently in politics and grandstanding at the federal level. But at the local level, when those decisions are made, they have to look you in the eye, and they know that they might bump into you at the store, and that's dangerous, and they don't want to do that. So that's one thing is the more local you can make it, the better. You can't do everything locally. We can't do national defense locally. But we can do decisions about water policy, agriculture, schools, even environmental stuff at the local level. So I think that's, that's when you look every public policy area has its rational and irrational parts. The more local you get, the more you tie it to the individuals who are being affected, the more rational, because there is a direct, the incentive is tied to the result, not to the image. One more question. I always ask, you know, somebody's got to disagree with me about the Snake River dams, and I don't mind. There's, this is a tough issue, and people care about salmon. So if there's somebody who disagrees with me and has another view, I welcome your comments or questions. See, now that's, that's a good sign, I guess. All right, thank you very much. I'll be around afterwards if you want to chat. <laughs> So I just want to take a minute and uh, acknowledge some of the, uh, or two of the outgoing board members. Uh, I would normally invite uh, Derek uh, Bronson and Joed uh, Nagaro, Nagaria uh, to the podium, but they're not here. So uh, we'll do it in abstention uh, from the standpoint that they have been on the board of directors for uh, quite some time, heavily involved in the uh, different committees that we have. And um, particularly, I want to acknowledge uh, Derek because it, it was him uh, and his board, along with uh, Lance Hobson and, and, those, and that board, that really started to put some concrete stability into the financial situation of the chamber and that allowed us to do some of the things that uh, we're doing today, which I'll um, actually address in a, a little bit uh, a little bit later but um did you want to go to yeah. Yeah. so all right and so we do have two board members uh, 
that are joining the board and um, uh, Vicki Haynes from uh, Atomic Dermatology couldn't be uh, with us today either. But uh, Kim Fall from Conover Insurance is with us. And so, <laughs> come on up. So it, installation. yeah. So this is a little insta installation. So I, I need to uh, read the responsibilities here. Uh, the responsibility you are accepting is exciting. You are called to be the leaders of this the leader of this association, promoting the Pasco Chamber as the front door for tens of thousands of individuals and businesses uh, that have come over the last hundred years representing business to agriculture to education and certainly the community. You will be called on to make sacrifices of your time, creative energy, uh, resources, and money. <laughs> uh, the requirements for serving this group may come at inconvenient times and you may be called upon to uh, stretch all of your present problem solving and conflict resolution skills. Um, do not assume your present commitment lightly. And to do a good job it will require all that is uh, in you. Will, <clears throat> excuse me. Will you, as newly elected officer and directors, realizing the responsibilities of leadership that will or that have been placed upon you, agree to give your time and energy faithfully to serve the Greater Pasco Chamber of Commerce in according with the bylaws? If so, please answer, I will. I will. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. I pre appreciate that. <laughs> so, um, as a membership uh, for uh, the chamber, all of you, uh, I've just given a view of what it takes to lead this organization. Now, to you, the membership, who have chosen these individuals as your leader or leaders, you have given them an important job, an impossible job without your help and your support. Express your appreciation to our leaders often, and they are serving to sacrifice for your benefit. It is up to you to be positively involved and assume responsibility for helping your fellow members. To the membership, with the foregoing understanding, do you pledge your support to these, your chosen leaders? Please indicate your support by saying, we do, Thank you and congratulations. Give your new board members a round of applause, please. Okay. So. Uh, I'd like to just say a couple of minutes as uh, the outgoing president. Um, first of all, I guess I would like to thank uh, Allie, Rebecca, and Marilyn for keeping Colin on task uh, over this last year. And uh, I see, I know where it starts. <laughs> I also would especially like to think, thank Colin for keeping me on task. And uh, it's been a very busy year, and uh, we couldn't do this without a solid organization. Uh, from the staff to the executive director, the board of directors, the executive committee, and so on. I was thinking that uh, uh, when Mr. Myers was giving his uh, presentation that um, uh, it's because of the financial footing of previous boards that we were able to focus on some fairly big issues over the last 12 months. And those issues are here this weekend with Riverfest, uh, with uh, the dams. Uh, the, tomorrow, 
Uh, it's going to be a combination of a lot of fun uh, for adults, for family, uh, but also it's going to be very educational. Uh, as far as uh, there's tugboats on the river, uh, there's um, a salmon cannon, um, and other things about uh, basically um, replanting um, young salmon so that they can grow in our rivers, uh, transportation, irrigation, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it allowed us also to adopt resolutions um, in support of the dams as a way of trying to get the word out <clears throat> and uh, argue against uh, corporations such as uh, Patagonia, um, who is uh, a company that is, uh, has actually been successful in removing, I think, and I might have to refer to Mr. Myers in, in regards to this, but I think Patagonia has been successful in re removing two or three dams on the Columbia River over the last, over the last few years. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, they have been a strong um, uh, proponent of uh, removing, the, removing the dams. But um, uh, at any rate, we also have um, uh, members of the uh, board who are sitting on the uh, Highway 395 Safety Corridor Committee, uh, which is in process at this particular point uh, in conjunction with the State Department of Transportation to improve that. Uh, they're in, uh, they've already had two meetings in regards to uh, suggestions from uh, uh, various industries of the public. Uh, trucking is an example and others that use that corridor and uh, so taking suggestions. It's been in design. Um, there is another meeting, uh, I believe sometime in October, uh, to continue to further that, uh, further that process. We have... Um, uh, uh, worked with the city of Pasco in regards to a communications pipeline, if you will, uh, in regards to Pasco being one of the safest cities. Um, was having lunch with uh, uh, our city manager Dave uh, Zabel, and and uh, said he said, you know, we should. I said something like we should be able to get the word out, and you said something like. Uh, yeah, it's really hard for us to brag, and I said, well, we can do it. And, fr <laughs> and from that, um, some of your communications people and our communications people got together, and we uh, created uh, a, a pipeline of information in order to be able to, to do that. Um, uh, I saw earlier Rolando Rodriguez was here, um, still is, right over there. And, uh, and he was telling me or giving me an update on a partnership that uh, uh, the Pasco Chamber has been involved with as far with Soul Case Management in order to, um, I guess, study and gather information and somehow work towards a more efficient process when it comes to workplace safety. And so that's an important partnership that will continue over the next uh, uh, few years and maybe even longer. Uh, depending on how successful it is. But these are some of the things that the board and, and the executive committee and the board of directors have been working on in order to help um, promote business, to promote employment, uh, to help uh, you know, with our environment, uh, ensure jobs. We did a resolution um, with the Wallula Mill against carbon tax for J. Uh, that Jay Ensley was uh, promoting. And these are all real issues that uh, we are involved with. And so I just wanted to uh, bring you up to date. And I also wanted to thank the board of directors for uh, their support of me, some of the initiatives that uh, uh, I had in order to um, change the organization as far as a kind of a long range planning process. I know uh, uh, Joe Roach is here. Uh, president next year is Tara Wiswall, and she's uh, excited about uh, putting some policy, policies and procedures, if you can imagine, uh, to the committees and that type of thing. But it's one of her strengths, so we're glad that she stepped up to be the uh, president. But these are some of the things that we're, that we're working on, and I uh, hope you agree that they're extremely worthwhile in this time. So thank you.
Uh, one other one other thing before we uh, conclude. Um, Colin actually just gave me this, and um, it's because of these uh, efforts and this involvement and so forth that um, uh, the U.S. House of Natural Resources Committee has actually scheduled a hearing to focus on the economic renewable energy and multiple other benefits provided by the uh, Columbian Snake River Dam. So uh, you slash we are being heard in regards to these important issues. And so uh, this uh, hearing or rally um, is actually, uh, oh, rally before the hearing um, is actually Monday, September 10th, 930, Pasco City Hall, outside. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so you are being heard. So on that note, I want to um, thank Giza Credit Union for being our sponsor today and um, the Washington Policy Center for sponsoring our keynote speaker. Thank you very much.